In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I'm joining you today from Tbilisi, Georgia, where we are on a pilgrimage, our third day of pilgrimage here. Um, very uh, um, good group, a uh, large group, 25 people from United States, Canada, uh, Bulgaria, <clears throat> Latvia, Russia, um, what other places? Yeah, Bulgaria. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned that, but anyways, I'm here in a hotel, uh, the top floor of the hotel, more in Tbilisi, uh, city center, old town. And uh, there's a beautiful view around me, maybe I can share afterwards. Uh, but anyways, it's late night here, it's still early, late day, uh, Friday, uh, there in the west, uh, Western Hemisphere. And I'll try to um, to still find some time to answer your questions and uh, also clear up some misunderstandings that I've uh, found in uh, in the uh, um, in the group responses. Uh, but I'm very impressed, uh, very impressed by the level of engagement. That's what uh, that's what the school is for. Is for uh, Putting forward uh, our uh, confusion, our, our misunderstanding, even uh, of uh, opening up and asking questions that we only used to ask ourselves. This is the what this school is for, and uh, I will also clarify more things about the school. Uh, uh, but first, we should answer the questions. So first and foremost, well done. Well done, everybody who, everybody who read through the, uh, uh, the text, who uh, made notes, who asked the questions. Some of the questions are repetitive, many meaning that several people had the same question. So I'll be answering it once, but I'll, uh, I'll try to make it as, as comprehensive as possible. But this topic seems to have attracted uh, attention and interest, and it is good because it is a very important topic, as you shall see. Uh, further on, when we talk about deification, how important this teaching is about the essence and energies of God. So let's start then from the beginning. Um, first is uh, Simeon Deretic uh, asking, I've been reading a lot of St. Gregory Palamas trying to better understand divine essence and energies. How is it that the light of the transfiguration is the energy of God, his grace, and not his essence? Well, as I tried to explain, the essence of God is invisible. And uh, maybe now is the time to expand a bit what we mean by the essence, although we don't understand what the essence of God is, but at least we'll, let's try to understand what the term essence means. Essence is the, the core of the being. Essence is the the innermost uh, heart of the being, that which defines uh, the being. Something that is uh, makes it what it is and differentiates it from other uh, essences. So there is, we can use as a synonym to the word essence as substance or nature. So the substance of the thing is what it is. It's to its core. Uh, so there is, and nature is the same thing. The nature of the thing is what it is, right? And uh, there's human nature. There is animal nature. There is um, nature of plants, nature of minerals, nature, all the things that are, that, uh, that can, can, be, can be grouped together as uh, collectively that share the common innermost essence of, of the being is what we call essence of those beings. And they're separated from each other within, within by being, um, in human terms, persons or individuals, in, in terms of animals, by individual animal of that uh, nature, in terms of plants and the different categories that the biology and botanical sciences have devised for categorizing plants and animals and so forth. But 
to make it very simple, nature is what is common and person or individual is what is distinct within the nature, right? So there is human nature, for example, right? And we can say the same, broadly apply that, also say also that it is human, human essence, meaning that what defines us as humans, what we share, every human being, despite our accidental differences, that one is born here, another one born there, one is of this age, another one of that, one is of this color, another of that, one is called Peter, another was called Paul, one has this character. Those are all individual characteristics, but what they share in common, what makes human beings human, is their essence. Right? So let us try to understand this essence is the innermost of the being, that which beings or different persons or different um, individual or different uh, members of that uh, uh, nature share in common. So having defined what essence uh, equals nature equals substance, means let us apply it to uh, to god as much as we can right god's essence is unknowable because god is so so incomprehensible in 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 terms of what his inner essence is inner nature the what he is that it is impossible either to see it either to know it either to comprehend it and so forth we cannot even comprehend human nature let, it all, let, let alone divine nature. What is human nature? What is the essence of, 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 of man? It's impossible for us to know. We, we know humans by their activities, by their characteristics, but the inner essence of uh, a created being, human being, is unknown to us. We don't know uh, inner essence of animals. We don't know inner essence of of plants, of minerals, of you know stars, you name it. It is impossible for us to know the inner essence because only the Creator knows the inner essence of what move, what that which moves it, that which defines it in its core, in its very heart, what makes it what it is. Only the Creator knows it. So we cannot even know the essences of created things, right? And that is given as a gift to saints and that is another topic when we advance spiritually the first gift that god gives to the to the saints is to to uh, spiritually contemplate the inner essences of created uh, things so that they contemplate and are awed and have theoria that is the vision of how god made created things and that, that is the first level of theoria, meaning first level of vision, of being awestruck at God's majesty, is the, 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 that God gives to his saints, those who purify it, is for that they can contemplate the inner essence of created beings. So if that much is needed for human beings to understand even an inkling about the nature of created things, what are we to say about God himself? God's, who, what, his essence is impossible for us to understand, to know, to comprehend and so forth. Only God himself knows his essence. Only the three persons of the Holy Trinity know uh, who uh, he is, right? So, since that is the case, whatever we can see about God, what we can know about God, contemplate about God, are through his energies. The energies are what allows us to know that same God who is unknowable in his essence. And here I will bring a metaphor that sometimes is used so as to us to understand um, in a metaphoric sense, the the difference between essence energies and how the, and how energy uh, essence, although being unreachable to us, uh, the same God whose essence is unreachable is still communicable for us through His energies. 
a metropolitan Ephraim used to like to use this 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 example the sun has the orb right the 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 orb itself of the sun but the orb does not define the sun it's not the orb is not the only thing about the sun uh, the sun also has light right that emanates from the orb so the orb itself the, the, which is the uh, from where the light emanates the orb itself for us is unreachable as metropolitan used to say uh, you try to touch the orb of the sun and you'll be fried to crisp <laughs> meaning that it's unreachable to us right but the light that emanates that proceeds that flows that radiates from the orb is communicable to us we can feel it we can see it we can enjoy it that light is sun just as the orb is the orb, the sun is not just the orb the light that emanates from the orb is sun too not the orb and yet the sun, it is still the sun so if we can make the analogy with essence and energies essence would be in this case what we um, to to compare the orb which is unreachable to us right and that orb is the essence of god is unreachable unknowable to us right it's it's hidden it's uh, it's it's something that uh, we cannot even start to comprehend but the light that emanates from that uh, essence the energies just as the light that emanates from the orb is comprehensible to us is knowable to us not uh, the study of by study of science like the sun but through spiritual perfection through life of purity and and, and ascesis and and progress in in spiritual life and that energy which proceeds which emanates which radiates from the essence of god is god just as the essence is in the same manner as the light that emanates from the orb is sun it's not something separate from sun it's not something that was that sun was without there was no time where sun was with the sun the visible sun was without light it always emanated from it therefore light is sun just as the orb of the sun is sun but the one is the uh, from the which is is unreachable and and away from us and uh, un, untouchable but the uh, light which emanates from that uh, orb is uh, um, tangible we can see it we can feel it we can enjoy it and so forth so the same way about the energies of god that same god which is unknowable in his essence because the innermost of God is unknowable. It's impossible for creatures to know the essence of God ever. And here will, I will add the parenthesis that neither in this life nor the age to come. The essence of God is never knowable to creature, whether in this life or after the resurrection, no matter how perfect human being is, uh, the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, the essence of God is beyond us. But same God, who is unknowable in his essence makes himself knowable through his activity that is through his energy for that what energy is it's the activity of the essence just as the light of the sun is the activity of the orb of the sun right so that same sun which is unknowable in its orb is knowable through the light which uh, which uh, we can feel and touch and, and, and see and so forth, right? In the same way, God, who is unknowable in his essence, in his innermost being, and these are words that we grasp for to, to define even uh, what essence of God is, the innermost of God and so forth. Obviously, it's not, these are not literal terms we should understand, but something that is so, uh, so inner, most of God that only God knows uh, knows it right that only the Father the Son and Holy Spirit know what essence of God is same God who is unknowable in his essence makes himself knowable through the energies just as the light of the orb makes us uh, uh, makes us accessible to the Sun 
that same sign which is un inaccessible uh, through the orb, we can't touch it, may is accessible through light, right? So that metaphor is not perfect, no metaphor is perfect, but gives us a glimpse of what we're talking about. That's why, to answer this question, uh, why the light of transfiguration uh, is um, is uh, or uh, an energy and grace and not his essence because the essence is beyond light the essence is beyond everything that we know about god it's something that is is above our capacity to understand anything about god just as the energies of God make God understandable to a degree to us. The essence of God is beyond anything that we can ever know and comprehend, right? And that's just the way things are. It's if we were to know the essence of God, we had to stop being of the essence of man. <laughs> you cannot know God being man because we are of one essence of human nature and God is of and divine nature. If we were to understand God's nature, we had to stop being of human nature. That's just the thing, how things are. And prying beyond that is inquisitiveness that will bring us nothing. So as, far as, as long as we know uh, how to define these things and those definitions to guide us in our knowledge uh, about God, that is sufficient. So why the uh, the light is uh, um, energy and not uh, the um, the essence well why is it that the orb of the sun is uh, sun is not knowable in its orb but uh, untouchable in its orb and is touchable in its light well because that's how it is the orb is something that will fry us to crisp right but the light is something that we can relate to, we can we can communicate with, meaning we can see with eyes and feel with uh, its temperature and, and so forth, right? In the same way, the essence of God is beyond us, but what God reveals us about himself is through his activities, because we can, uh, to a certain degree, by progress in spiritual life, come to know and comprehend and uh, be in communion with God in his energy. So. I hope these definitions help you to uh, help to answer this question because I don't think there is a, an answer beyond this, right? Because why essence is unknowable, there is no answer to it except what I just provided. Because essence of God is known only to God, and if we were, if God does not reveal His essence, because we are unable to uh, to comprehend and live basically to comprehend and still be humans we had to be something else that is god by nature to understand uh, god's nature but we are humans only called to be gods by grace not by nature and being gods by grace who the, that's what the saints are they can understand god as much as it is revealed as much as they're filled with through the energies that is through grace because they became gods by grace not by nature right so nature of god is known only to him uh, and we had to stop being humans to understand god's nature we had to become gods by, by nature which we cannot only father son and holy spirit are god by nature okay so i hope this um uh, settles that question i think there will be several others that uh, are similar to it, but um, we'll we'll deal with them uh, um, in, in in turn. So um, Alex uh, from Georgia, uh, since it says that God blew into life into clay, can we say that the soul is related to the grace of God, related in uh, uh, inverted commas, or that our conscience is related to it, since it's called the voice of God in our mind? Yes, yes, of course, it's related to a sense and sense, not by nature, though, right? It's related because God created blue. When God blows into Adam, uh, his, his spirit, he blows his grace, without a doubt. It, the, the, the Holy Spirit blows his grace, the common energy of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit blows uh, into, uh, uh, into Adam and creates 
some fathers say soul other fathers say that soul was already created and he uh, blew spirit in the soul and make it a li made it a living uh, uh, soul right so no matter which one it is uh, the, the, the point is that God blew grace into Adam and in that sense we can say that a uh, human being is related or human soul or human spirit is related to the grace of God uh, yes we can some fathers have gone as far as to say that God put his own particle in, in human beings not his uh, natural particle but blew his grace that's what they mean St. Macarius talks in those terms uh, that we we are we have part of God in us and St. Gregory theologian speaks so as well but we don't have part of God's nature in us right we have uh, an uh, God's grace that animates us that gives us life and since we human beings obviously all creation is 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 given existence to go by god's grace right and uh, animals have life as well but human beings have it in a special sense because we bear the image of god meaning that there is something special that was given to us grace of god acted in a very special way towards humans when uh, god blew in 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 adam and gives that same breath to every human being not just breath through the nostrils but the the uh, life as we know it in human beings our consciousness and our rational mind are uh, all those things that that make us rational beings right that is the image of god in us so since we bear the image of god in us obviously what uh, God blew in us uh, by his grace was something that was related uh, related uh, obviously not um, strictly related by nature but something that was similar to him right so the spirit that animates man, man is something similar to uh, God's spirit right and that spirit can also be understood as grace is throughout the fathers so this i'll put a small parenthesis that spirit is uh, according to some basil is understood in in several ways uh, in two ways especially when it preferred to 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 god the holy spirit which is the person of the holy spirit and the common energy of the trinity that is the the energy the 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 grace of god is also many times called spirit of god right so that two understandings of spirit the person of the holy trinity and the grace that is that is common to the energy and grace that is common to all three persons of the holy trinity is also referred to as spirit uh, many times so when when we say that god blew his spirit it means that he blew uh, through the holy spirit the spirit that is the common energy right uh, uh, in, 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 into hum humans and that is animating us and obviously because of that we that we are related to certain sense right our image is related to the prototype uh, without a doubt uh, the nature of that relation is obviously beyond us to understand but that yes there is a a, 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 a image a a connection a, a communion a, a semblance uh, with uh, between uh, humans the human spirit and the spirit of god that gave us that spirit that is ours right uh, is is obvious so but the nature of it uh, let's not pry into it what uh, in what way we are uh, related is i think something that we could find in the fathers but it will be still definitions not uh, something that will be fully comprehensible right but yes uh, to that uh, um, to that sort of qualified uh, relationship right when you say related in in quotation marks yes in that sense yes and related not by nature but by the uh, relationship that would be between the image and the prototype right that is the kind of relationship we could say is between our spirit that was given to us and the spirit <clears throat> that was that blew it into us that is the grace of god that 
that that animated us, right? <clears throat> so uh, that's that's from Alex, and I hope that that answers that question. From Gregory in Boston, um, uh, he quotes uh, the, the 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 lesson saying his uncreated energy not visible to earthly eyes. Is that why his disciples are seen falling down in the uh, transfiguration icon? Or is there something else to it? Well, the light that was seen uh, was not um, seen by earthly eyes. Or rather, um, it wasn't the light that can be seen by earthly eyes, right? It was the light that can be seen by the mind. And then there is another question about the nature of this light, which we can uh, explain afterwards. But uh, they're falling down because the light that they saw with their mind, right, with their uh, spiritual vision, with the with their, uh, was so overwhelming that they fell down. Not because their ocular organs became, were burnt, not because of that, because the light that was shown was not physical light wasn't made of atoms and and and, uh, and uh, electrons and photons and all that it was uh, a, a grace of god which is not perceived through the air by uh, our uh, earthly eyes but rather by the eyes of the mind the eyes of the soul the spiritual eyes right that we all have but we have it darkened because we don't exert ourselves in, in holiness, but the saints have it open. And that's why they can see the grace of God with their spiritual eyes. So the apostles were given on Mount Tabor, they, their eyes, the spiritual eyes were opened for a moment for them to see that grace that always radiates from our Savior's body. Not that our Savior suddenly flashed the, his uh, the light in front of them uh, uh, and then stopped uh, f flashing that light no it's that they at that moment were given their eyes their inner eyes were open to see that light that always flows from our savior because his body having been united with his divinity divinity permeated his body entirely with with energy by virtue of unity of of, of his divine nature and human nature in his person in his divine person of the son of god one of the trinity his human nature and we will cover this in the next lesson about the incarnation which is coming the fourth lesson his human nature is entirely united and the fathers call it hypostatic unity something a kind of unity is that is beyond our understanding and not simply dwelling like god's grace dwells in saints that was not the kind of unity that was between our Savior's human nature and his divine nature. There was hypostatic unity, meaning unity in his person. His divine person assumed human nature and permeated uh, uh, his human nature with divine grace that always flows from his divine nature, right? So that grace was always flowing from our Savior. The disciples were given a a, a, a moment uh, with uh, to behold this with their spiritual eyes that's why they fall the the light the energy that is flowing from our savior is so overwhelming for their souls not for their eyes for their souls that that uh, it's uh, um, they they fall down uh, to the earth so and now and here i will answer the other question that was uh, posed by Anna uh, from from Georgia, and it, it relates to this. What's the nature of that light? And uh, I think answering this question will elucidate this this point. So the light is one of the energies, which it is. Light is the energy of God. Energies are qualities of God that God has. We try to acquire these qualities: love, truth, mercy, and so forth, to be like Him, as the saints did. Uh, all these are things that we make the choice to do. We try to be loving instead of hateful and so forth. So uh, the energies of God, which are his attributes, his qualities, we uh, participate in, in them by advancing in imitating, in, in partaking of those qualities like love, mercy, truth and so forth, right? But she asks, what is the purpose of the light? 
uh, is it just something that comes along all the other qualities or is it the result of having is it the result of having those qualities and this is a good question because love mercy truth goodness uh, all those are qualities that that they're, they're moral qualities, they're mystical because we, they are they're god's qualities but by our uh, life we can imitate them but what about light right what quality is that that we can imitate which is a good question well <clears throat> here is the answer that light is in a sense says is said metaphorically about the light of god right we say light of god because uh, by by metaphor meaning that the visible light right uh, illuminates us through visible light we can see things it makes things clear right through visible light we can see the creation without this visible light we are in darkness right so this visible uh, example right of visible light is applied to the divine light but it won't say, it won't in what sense that divine light illumines the mind meaning that it grants knowledge to the mind so when we say that the uh, that they saw god's light meaning that they acquired knowledge about god and that that in our literally literary culture light and knowledge are related to each other is obvious right to be enlightened is not to be full of you know electric bulbs that doesn't mean to be enlightened it means to have knowledge right uh, even there are in the comic books we have somebody having a brilliant idea and there is a light bulb going right <laughs> there is a connection what is the connection it's not a physical light bulb that went into in head but he had a bright idea right so the bulb is 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 uh, explaining to us that he had an idea meaning that the the, the there is a there is a a real uh, let's say um, relationship in our culture and in 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 the uh, hebrew culture and uh, greek culture and uh, most of the cultures between light and knowledge right so when we acquire knowledge we are enlightened we are illumined right we become bright uh, uh, and when we don't have knowledge when we are ignorant we are in darkness right so that is how we have to understand divine light that divine light is what brings knowledge of God. So when we hear divine light, we should straight away think the knowledge of God that comes only from God. So let us apply this to Mount Tabor, the transfiguration. What is happening there? Why are the apostles falling down? Because the flow of knowledge of God from our Savior was so great that it was overwhelming to them. That is what, what, what is happening. That the light that illumined them, meaning the knowledge that was about God, and knowledge about God is infinite. St. Gregory of Nyssa says that knowledge of God is without end, because God is eternal, knowledge of Him, or that is knowing Him, is eternal too. So the light of God, right, is knowledge about Him that flows from Him constantly, right? And this knowledge is called light because it enlightens the mind uh, and not brains. When talking about the, the, the brain uh, neurons and, and things, we're talking about the mind, which is a, an invisible uh, um, organ uh, in human beings with which we have communion with God. That mind is enlightened by, that is, mind gains knowledge about God. That is what enlightenment by God's uh, light means. So that is the, the understanding of light of God. It's the knowledge of God. It's knowledge about God. It's progress in communion with Him. That is to be partakers of the light of God, to be illumined by light of God, to be enlightened by light of God. And God's, wherever there is light uh, shining, right? It's, it's knowledge of God flowing from him. And the knowledge that was flowing from our Savior was so unchecked, that it was so 
bright and that is in the amount uh, and, and strength of the let's say information right to say very crudely that was flowing from him that the apostles were overwhelmed by it their, their, their earthen vessels their their souls their minds were so overwhelmed by the revelation of God yeah that's another thing we should always uh, uh, remember when we talk about light of God it's revelation of God God reveals himself God enlightens when we hear light of God we should straight away think of revelation knowledge uh, uh, of God right about God so that is what light is it's knowledge of God it's his revelation right uh, that is the uh, uh, the light as energy of God that's what it is so I hope this sort of uh, uh, rounded the uh, the uh, the whole question about uh, light of transfiguration and also that Grisha asked and also that uh, particular question that Anna asked about what is the light in terms of how we define light as energy of God right it's the knowledge of God his revelation of knowledge about and of truths about him of his wisdom and all it, it's it's you can even say that light of God is revelation of everything about him right which includes uh, his mercy his love his his uh, truth his uh, um, all the other uh, things that god wants to reveal himself light when we say light of god it's revelation of all those things is uh, knowledge about him is god defining himself to us god revealing himself to us right so uh, next uh, comes the question about the names of God and these are good questions there are two persons that ask this question uh, but I will leave this for the last uh, uh, and uh, because it is something that I have I want to deal uh, on in this uh, um, video uh, separately uh, at, the, at the end because there's a lot of uh, you know things need to be processed there but, so I will jump to the next question and I will return to the uh, to the questions about name of God and relationship with uh, the energies of God. So the next question is by Anna Maria from Boston and she has three questions. Uh, what does part uh, that part of the lesson mean when it says every essence possesses and produces its natural activity or energy? The uncreated essence of God possesses equally uncreated divine activities and energies. Uh, or energy specifically what does it mean natural activity and divine activities well um, the fathers teach that every nature right uh, human nature animal nature plant nature they uh, possesses its own activity that's that's uh, uh, fathers taught about this everywhere that there is no nature that doesn't have its own activity right its own attributes its own characteristics that uh, uh, that that it, it uh, it's it's let's say its activity is the best word to use here because characteristic and attribute can be sort of confused with personal uh, attributes of each individual partaker of that nature so let's forget that let's talk about activity that every nature has its activity right that human uh, um, in humans for example the uh, the energy of humans is, for example, the will that humans have, that with the volition they, uh, that humans have, which is hu part of human nature. The activity of human nature is shown in the will, the human will that human nature possesses, right? So the human will is the activity of human nature, right? So the activity of human nature is is will but not only will it's it's action as well that we can act we can do things right so there is no nature without activity it's 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 has it, nature has its own activity so the fathers were saying and the fathers of the hesychast councils were using this uh, sort of uh, uh, analogy to 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 show that it was so ludicrous to say that god had no energies because that's what Barlam or, uh, uh, of Calabria was saying that God's energies are created things they're not natural activities of God uh, that they were saying that every we know from from even from Greek philosophers that every nature has its 
natural activity that is activity that is natural to it just as human will is natural to human nature right uh, uh, human uh, volition uh, that is uh, movement of nature uh, uh, is the volition uh, in human beings that every nature whether it be human animal angelic uh, demonic has its uh, activity right now whether that activity is 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 let's say uh, true or perverted that's another thing that's a whole different topic that's where sin and passions come in how the volition of nature is is being corrupted because of sin and that's why uh, nature is, is is broken that that the volition does not correspond to, to nature in humans and in demons right by demons uh, forever but in humans it's still mendable right but that's another topic but what the fathers were saying is that we know from uh, from even Greek philosophers, right? And we know from common knowledge that every nature has its natural activity, right? And that activity is natural to it, that it, whatever nature is of the same, nature is the activity, that is, that it, it belongs to it, it's not something separate to it. Uh, therefore, God being uncreated and possesses uncreated nature and essence, God's activity, that is his energy, is also uncreated. So that is what they, what they were trying to do. That's, that's sort of the argument that they were trying to make by uh, analogy, right? That we know that every uh, um, nature has its natural activity, right? And through its activities is the nature recognized, right? So God being uncreated in his essence, and nobody denied that ever that God is uncreated in his essence because then that he would meet, we wouldn't be God, right? Possesses equally uncreated activity, that is energy, his volition, his, his activity, his, uh, uh, what we call grace, right? His uh, action, his will, his everything that we spoke about in the, in the lesson. Uh, because human nature being created, human nature possesses created activity, created uh, um, energy, right? Created will and so forth. But uh, God being uncreated and uh, uh, of essence and unknowable in his essence, as we spoke, possesses equally uncreated energy because of whatever uh, quality is the uh, uh, essence is uh, corresponding is the activity of it, right? So it's impossible that God should be of uncreated essence and he should have created activity because it wouldn't correspond one to another so that was sort of the logical argu argument they tried to use that's what this refers to what i wrote there because it's included in the anathemas this argumentation in the anathemas against barlam it's included that we read in the uh, sunday of orthodoxy uh, when we defend the theology of saint gregory palamas and the hesychast councils of the 14th century and condemn Barlam and Akindinus and their followers. This is the argument that is contained there. That's why I included it there because it um, it shows how lucidly the fathers thought, right, and how they used even um, uh, examples from this life to make logical conclusions. Obviously, not fully lit in in the literal sense, but as much as it, it can correspond, and must, as much as you know, human logic can make conclusions about God. It, it made the uh, uh, they made those arguments about uh, trying to uh, define uh, things about God too define again right not that we can define God but at least we can define terms about God so um, that's what it means I hope um, I, it's understandable right and again if you if something that I say here uh, in answers is not uh, um, comprehensible we go back to it right you can ask again or you can contact me privately either way uh, we we want to that's what the school is for uh, the school is to uh, is uh, should be difficult it should be challenging right if it's not challenging it means not we're not doing our work we're not doing our job well uh, uh, and and uh, obviously things will not be understandable, things will be difficult to understand, and that's the point of the school. Otherwise, it would be a, a club where we just chat, right? This is not the point of this group. It's a school where we'll be challenged, we we'll, we'll, won't understand things, and this is the place where we should we should uh, respond to that challenge, right? And, and, and say, I will try better 
I will try to understand because these are terms that I need to understand. Um, and I will explain more about what the school should be and should not be like uh, uh, afterwards because I need to address address this this, this uh, issue too. And the second question from uh, Maria, can you clarify this part, especially the second half? I confess, therefore, that both divine essence and divine energies are God, except that the former is the cause and the source of the latter. Well, the essence is the cause of uh, uh, the energy. That's uh, how it is. The, the, they're both God, but one is the cause of the other. Let's go to the sun again, right? The orb of the sun is the cause of the light that comes from the orb, but in together they are sun. Just, it's not just the orb that is the sun without the light. Together they are the sun, right? There is no orb without the light. So orb of the sun is the cause of the light that proceeds from it, right? We agree on that. In the same way, the essence of God is the cause and the origin and the fountain of the energy that flows from it, just as the light and energy of the sun flows from the orb. But together, they are God, not just essence, not just energy, obviously, but together, they are God, just as the orb and the light that flows from it together are the sun. So I hope that explains what, what this um, part of the lesson meant, right? That uh, they are God, essence and energy are God, just as the orb and the light are the sun, not just the orb, right, without the light. And it, in the same way, not just the essence without the energy. Both essence and energy that flows from it are God together. And if we, that's why we are able to partake of God, because energy of God is God, flowing from the essence, but is God. And by partaking of the uh, energy of God, we have a possibility of deification, of partaking of God himself. If the energy of God was not God, then we wouldn't have a chance of deification, because we wouldn't be touching God ever. If, and if just the essence of God is God, then we have no communion with God. We have, there is a chasm between us and God. Because the essence of God is untouchable, is unknowable, is unapproachable. That is why we can be defied. That is why we can be partakers of divinity. That's why God can dwell in us. And the saints can be defied. That is God entirely permeating them. Because it's not the essence only that is God, but the energy that flows from it too. Therefore, the energy being God just as the essence is, but the, with the difference that the essence is unknowable and the cause of the energy and the energy is knowable, that is approachable, and the, and the result that is what is caused, right? And this we're talking in eternal terms, right? Not that there was a time where energy didn't flow from God. It's just as whenever was the sun, there was always the orb and the light, right? So uh, to, to finalize this point, that uh, because the energy is God, uh, th th that's why we can be partakers of God. Not of the essence, but of the energy, which is God, right? So I'm, I hope you can really grasp this, because if you grasp this, you can understand what our faith is about. Without this, you really can't understand why we are struggling. How do the saints become God bearers and Christ bearers and God seers, right? How is that possible? And to make things even clearer, only the Orthodox Church, being the true Church of Christ, possesses this doctrine. The true doctrine of the prophets, apostles and, and the martyrs and fathers about deification. Other churches, might, the so-called churches, might say they believe in deification, but they do not have the doctrine that proves it, that they do believe in deification. Because neither Catholics, neither Protestants, neither any other of the Oriental churches, so-called, have the teaching that the divine energies are God himself. That's why this is so important, because without it, the whole process of our deification unravels, because that by which we come partakers of divinity, that is the energies of God, if they are not God himself, we are never partakers of God. 
just as if the light of this of of the orb that touches us right the light of the sun is not sun but something else other than the sun that it is not the sun that we are warmed with it is not the sun's light that we see something else we never really come into contact with the sun in the same way if the energies of god are not god but something else in between us and god and god is just the essence then there is a chasm between us this is empty here is our, here is us here is god's essence and in between there is emptiness there is unbridgeable chasm right but that's not what we believe we believe that this chasm is bridged by the energies of god which flow from divine essence constantly eternally and that is why we can partakers become partakers of god because not only his essence is god but also what flows from him that is his energies so i hope that explains it right and then the third question from Anna Maria. Can you also clarify this part rather apprehended by spiritual sight when talking about the uncreated light? We spoke about this, right? So I will just reiterate that spiritual sight is the sight of the mind, which the we all possess, but we all have it blinded because that's the one of the effects of the fall, right? That we are born human beings with a mind that is uh, blind. Uh, to see uh, invisible things. Adam was not like that. Adam spoke with God uh, face to face, uh, with not with visible eyes, but with the eyes of the mind. And those eyes were darkened with, with, uh, in him after the expulsion from, from Eden, right? And we, his, uh, uh, his uh, procreation, his descendants, are born with this, this one particular, among others, uh, um, let's say curse let's say effects of the fall right uh, defects spiritual defects if you want right uh, that we our mind is blinded and does those eyes that it has are not opened they open when we struggle when we purify ourselves through sorry about the noise outside um, when we purify ourselves from the passions that darken our mind and acquire virtues, those eyes are they slowly open and then we're able to see invisible things, right? And most important, not only angelic, the created invisible things, but uncreated, that is, the grace of God, the light of God. So the apostles, when they saw the light on Mount Tabor, they saw it with those eyes that God opened for them, Christ opened for them at that moment. And they were able to see the reality about Christ, that Christ's body was shining with this light, which is the knowledge, the revelation uh, flowing from him, right? So that's what we mean by uh, that they are apprehended by spiritual sight, that grace of God cannot be seen by these eyes because that when we say that it is light, it's not visible light through the air, right? Like the light of the sun but or, or, or an electric bulb or, or lightning or so forth. But rather, it is light that is knowledge of God called light in our language that is seen, that is is apprehended, seen not in terms of the ocular organs, that is the eyes, but but uh, um, received, right, uh, 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 understood or comprehended through the eyes of the mind, which is the organs uh, the, of the mind with which we can commune with God, right? So that's what it means that uh, apprehended by spiritual sight. I hope that is is comprehensible. Now, the next question. Um, uh, Basil Deritich asked from uh, Minnesota, who is here actually in, in, uh, in Georgia on a pilgrimage. Um, he asked the same question as Anna Maria about the, uh, the that we just answered, tried to answer. And uh, uh, I won't go back to it. I think we spoke about it, uh, the questions that Anna Maria asked about uh, specifically about this uh, the second question about uh, uh, the earthly eyes uh, not being able to see the uncreated light well, that was the third question the second question he had about 
the um, divine essence, uh, the essence and, 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 and it's a natural activity, what it means, we answered that as well. Um, so you can listen to it if you missed it uh, earlier in this recording. And now Maria from Brazil asked, why cannot the essence of God be accessed but only his energies? I think we spoke about that too, uh, that it's, it's just if we were able to access God's essence, we need to be gods by nature and we are not right we are of different nature and and we're not talking about created nature we're not talking about understanding you know nature of animals or plants right or of angels even right we're talking about understanding the essence of god it's impossible it's beyond us we had to stop being humans by nature and become gods by nature to understand god's essence and that is impossible we can understand him only through his activity, his energy, his grace, right? That's why. Again, let's go back to the metaphor about the sun. The sun is inaccessible because it will burn you, right? But the light is inaccessible because it's, 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 it, it won't burn you, right? It, it will, you will see it, you will enjoy it, you will uh, see things through it and so forth, right? In the same way, a metaphor, but let's translate it, God's essence is so awesome, so beyond us, so above everything, every notion, every mind, every opinion, every thought that we can even imagine to have, right, that is inaccessible to us. But that same God becomes accessible to us through his energy, through his activity, right? Just as the sun becomes accessible to us, although inaccessible in the orb, right, which is flaming and hot and and will fry us to crisp as metropolitan used to say becomes that same sun becomes accessible to us through the light that flows from the orb so anna from georgia i answered her first question about the nature of the light and she has another question who become partakers of divinity by real participation in him that is the eucharist yes above all eucharist but not only, because um, Eucharist is participation that is the most real, because we partake, uh, when we partake of the body of Christ, his body is united in a hypostatic unity. And that is a term also we'll have to learn, right? Hypostatic unity is a kind of unity that is beyond our definition. There is unity between God and man, in the saints, for example, right? Where God dwells in the saint because he purified his heart and God came and abode in him. That is unity, right? Uh, but that is unity by grace, meaning that God abides with his grace uh, in, in, in the saint and fills with his grace that is with himself. Fine, that is unity. But hypostatic unity is something even beyond that. It's when uh, Christ, when our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, one of the Holy Trinity, the Son of the Father, in his divine person, assumes human nature, right? That unity that is in him, right, is so awesome, so impossible to understand, so incredible, where there is unity without division. So there is both unity uh, without division and there is two natures without confusion at the same time and we'll talk this about next lesson about the incarnation those terms two natures without confusion and uh, unity without division right that this is the father's called hypostatic unity meaning unity of two natures in the hypostasis of the son of god we learned that there are three hypostases right of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit one of the three the hypostasis of the son and the hypostasis can be translated in our language as persons. One person, one hypothesis of the Holy Trinity became man, the Son, right, of the Father, the Logos, the Word uh, of the Father. In his hypothesis, that is in his person, that is divine by nature, he assumed also, united to himself, human nature from the Virgin Mary, right? And the nature of this unity, the Father's called hypostatic unity, meaning that unity in his hypostasis, in his person, where the nature of humanity is preserved, divinity is preserved, 
and they're united in such an intricate manner that they're indivisible and yet they're two at the same time. They're not confused. They don't become one because of unity. That's a uh, monophysite heresy. They're not divided uh, in two different uh, uh, sort of entities that have no unity. That is Nestorianism, right? And we'll talk about those two next uh, lesson. Uh, but rather, there's the kind of unity that is beyond our definition even, right? They call it hypostatic unity. Well, the unity is so, uh, or is such that is far above the kind of unity that there is uh, when God abides in saints, in the saints, right? So there, there is God's grace present, but the, the way that God's grace permeates our Savior's body is something beyond us, right? That's why the participation in our Savior's body and blood is communion, participation in Him by definition. There is no greater way of participation, right? And that is the greatest gift there is. There is no uh, closer way to be with God. There is no uh, you know, tighter way to be with God than to partake of His body, which is in hypostatic unity with His divinity, right? So that is why uh, uh, when we say real participation, yes, we mean that. But not only that, meaning that um, what I meant in that uh, um, real participation, meaning that our participation is not symbolic. It's not that we just simply say that we partake of God, but we really what we mean is imitate Him, right? Become like Him without ever touching Him. That's not what we orthodoxy is about. Protestant faith is about that. Catholic faith is about that. It's imitating God, right? It's be like him, but we, you don't really come to touch him. Orthodoxy, and this is what I meant when we become partakers, we become partakers of divinity by real participation in him, meaning that we really come to touch in spiritual sense, right? And in physical even, because of partaking of the holy mysteries, uh, Christ's body, which is united with his divinity in an inseparable and unconfused manner so that we really partake of God. We really are touching him. We really are in communion with him in real way, not symbolically, not metaphorically, not uh, allegorically, not uh, morally, right? Meaning that by imitation that we become like him by moral actions. And that's the extent of our communion with God, that we really simply become like Him without ever touching Him. No. Christi Orthodox Christianity is about participation with God. And that participation means deification, that we become gods by grace, that God permeates us so fully that we become adopted sons of the Father. So that just as our Savior Jesus Christ is the natural Son of the Father. He is the only begotten Son of the Father. We become adopted sons of the Father. That's what adoption means, that we become so filled with the grace. We become so tight with Christ, right, that He becomes our brother and the Heavenly Father becomes our adopted Father. So that what is by nature in Him becomes by grace by participation in us, that we, what is He by nature, that is, He is the Son of the Father, we become by adoption. That's the degree of participation that we're talking about, right? So, I mean, your reference to Eucharist is right. That is the, that is the maximum expression of that participation. But what I meant there in this lesson is that our participation in God is not symbolic that when we say that we partake of uh, divine grace, that the grace illumines us, grace, uh, you know, fills us, and we, I don't know what other things I said uh, there in the lesson, let me refresh my uh, memory, that um, the, um, That we say that you know uh, that God's grace uh, purifies, sanctifies, illumines both angels and men, 
through which we become partakers of divinity by real participation, that the grace of God does all those things, meaning God does those, all, the, all those things. And because the grace of God is God, that grace that comes to do all these things with us means that we are really partaking of God, not some intermediary force. That's what Catholics believe, that grace of God is something created that God creates in order to commune with us, something created you know, supernatural, flashy, uh, that God creates. And he, through that created grace, uh, he communes with us, right? That's not, we, that, that means that we never touch God himself because that created thing, being created, created grace, is part of creation, not of the creator, right? So no matter how much we partake of that created grace, there's always a limit, there's a chasm, because... We're not partaking of the Creator Himself, but rather of something, a creation, that is between us and, and the Creator. That's why the doctrine of created grace is unacceptable, because then we are not participating really in God by receiving grace, by being filled by grace, but in something created, right? So that's my answer to, to, to uh, Anna from, from Georgia, that... What I meant about real participation is that grace is uncreated and God himself, his energy, right? Therefore, by partaking of that grace, we really are partaking of God. As opposed to the heterodox teaching that God's grace that which he bestows on us, God's blessings, right? God's energy that he, uh, with which he sanctifies is something that he creates. It's not really himself. He created this beautiful thing, which is called grace, with which he sanctifies us. Well, we, it means that we are not really touching God, because whatever is created is part of creation, not of the creator. But we believe that grace is, is part of creator, part, meaning not that God has parts, but it's him, it's his light, it's, it's his, uh, not something created. Therefore, when that grace is cleansing us, purifying us, when we are partaking of it, right, when that grace abides in us, it's God himself abiding in us. And therefore, that's a real participation as opposed to uh, um, sort of symbolic or semi, or par not even semi or partial, sort of fake participation where God's created grace with which we are sanctified is something created still. We're still not touching God himself, but something God created to interact with us. So by real participation, this was what I mean, that grace of God being God himself, when we touch that grace and we do touch that grace, especially in Holy Eucharist, it's a real participation in Godhead. It's real participation in, in, in God and not a, a, a participation in some intermediary force which we call grace, right? So that's why the doctrine about grace of God being uncreated is so important because in, if, God is, is, if grace of God is something created, that, then we're alone. We're not, there is a chasm between us and the Creator. We're not really partaking of Him. We're not really participating in Him. So uh, that's what I mean in, in a, a real participation. But of course, in this real participation, the, the pinnacle of it, right, is the Holy Eucharist. Because in Holy Eucharist, in the body and blood of our Savior, it, it, the divinity is so present, like in no other, um, let's say, medium, right? Because we acquire grace through prayer, right? We pray and, 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 and through prayer we acquire grace. We, grace comes and dwells in us. We give charity. We, we struggle. We humble ourselves. We fast. We do all those things to purify our hearts so that God will come and dwell in us. And God comes and dwells in us. But in a most perfect manner, God comes and dwells when he enters holy through, uh, in us through his body and blood. Right? So there are ways of participation of God. And, but the pinnacle of it is the Holy Eucharist. In fact, some of the fathers say that all those other things that we do, the prayer, fasting, uh, practicing, uh, you know, keeping the commandments, uh, advancing in virtues, fighting the passions, uh, all those things are a sort of a preparation for a worthy, not that we will ever be worthy, but as much as is possible, worthy partaking of the Holy Mysteries. 
all those things are means to that end so that we we that our partaking of the mystery will be as perfect as possible that's why in the saints partaking of the mysteries was so different they could feel our savior they could they could they were really in communion with our savior and when they partook of the holy mysteries why because they did all those other things that we fail to do do imperfectly our prayer our fasting it's you know lack it's lacking right all of us in our generation it's lacking uh, nobody can say that we pray as we should or fast as we should or as alms givers as we should or as humble as uh, and all those things right as pure and uh, no one can say that as opposed to uh, generations uh, before us uh, so all those things the fathers say are preparations for a perfect communion right those things prepare us for that of the partaking of body and blood and of our savior and when those things are in order our uh, communion of of body of eucharist is become something else something otherworldly right but in our case it's not it's it's yes we are there with full consciousness we are there with awe and dread partaking of the mysteries but we have to force ourselves many times to fully grasp what we're doing at that moment that the body of christ is entering us right if all those other things were in order then our partaking of those mysteries would be a transfiguring event every time and that's what it was in the saints right so i hope i explained this part to anna and answered her question right so, uh, so now there is also a question from Um, so Michael uh, from Seattle asks, can in heaven the God's essence be known, or is his essence always only known by the presence of the Holy Trinity? Neither on earth nor in heaven by anyone except the person of the Holy Trinity can the essence of God be known, right? By n no one, uh, uh, whether in this life or after resurrection, uh, the, we participate in this life and more perfectly after resurrection in the energies of God. We advance in, in, in knowing God through his energies. But the essence will only be known by the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, nobody else, either in this, on this earth or after the resurrection. So that's Michael's uh, question uh, that uh, the, the answer is for. So, uh, um, Anna Maria asks also about the name of God, and I'm leaving this um, for for the end uh, about uh, to to explain. I'll go now to George uh, um, uh, Angelos for, for from Seattle. Could you uh, please explain further difference between ed energies and uh, essence? I think I did. I mean, I don't know how else to explain it, uh, and uh, so I will skip. Jump to the second part of his question, where he says, "Also, where the holy mysteries fit in both of these?" Well, that's that's a good question. I, I touched it a bit in my answer to to Anna, and I'll say, uh, repeat again that the whole Christ's body is so permeated with the energies, right? Because the essence is not uh, the essence of, of of divinity. That is the God's essence and. Uh, divine essence, Christ in Christ, his divine essence and uh, his human essence, that is his divine nature and his human nature, remain. They're not confused, they're not infused, they're not, they, not, they do not stop being divine and human and become something else. No, they're two natures, two essences in Christ, divine and human. But Christ's div uh, human nature is so permeated by his divine energies in because of the hypostatic unity that is unity of two natures in the hypostasis in the person of the son of god our savior jesus christ that that unity so permeates christ's body because he uh, in let's i'll try to transliterate the greek word in hypostatized in himself the human nature that is 
to say it in, in English, he assumed in his hypostasis, assumed in his divine hypostasis, the human nature, in such a way that the grace, the divine energy that flows from his divine nature is so united, so permeates his, divine, his human nature that partaking of the body and blood of our Savior is the pinnacle of, of communing with God, right? Uh, the, the, the degree to which we receive divine energies that are always present in Christ's body because Christ's body is united to his divine nature, right? And therefore, energies flowing from his divine nature are so intricately united and, and, and permeating his human nature. That's the explanation of the transfiguration, what the apostles saw, that light was flowing from his body, right? That is, his body is so permeated by, by uh, divine energies that uh, partaking of that body is the pinnacle, is the, the most perfect union that can be. Uh, we become, uh, you know, so united with God that everything else is, becomes really, a, uh, comes under shadow, right? As I said, some fathers say even that everything else that we do is a sort of preparation for that and that's why it's so important. The Holy Communion is so important. It's central in our life. So um, the, the essence, divine essence and, and human essence are united in Christ. But they're not infused. They're not, let's say, uh, confused. They're not mingled with each other. Like, you know, that there is no uh, divine and human left. And at the same time, they're, they're inseparable. Their unity is so tight that you cannot separate it, but neither are they mingled with each other, so that it's a mixture of a kind, that there is no divine and human anymore, and some kind of a mixture between them. They, there's intricate unity, indivisible unity, and also there is no confusion, right, at the same time. Well, this unity, this, this straight unity, this tight unity between Christ's divine essence and his human essence is so tight that the energies that flow from his the, the divine essence are so permeating, are so, so filled our Savior's human nature from the moment of his conception in the womb of the Theotokos that partaking of his the uh, human nature which we do at the uh, divine liturgy gives us direct access to his uh, uh, divinity through the energies right so we p p become partakers of divinity uh, uh, through divine energies that are permeating christ's human body right so a uh, human nature so i hope that explains the, the importance of eucharist right that there is no unity with divinity as great as it is in Christ, uh, that the unity between his divinity and his humanity are so strong, so incredible, so impossible to comprehend even that uh, it, it is, it, it's beyond description. Well, we were given a gift of, of direct access to his divinity by partaking of his humanity. His divinity and humanity are unconfused and inseparable at the same time when we partake of his human nature it gives us straight access to his divinity not his divine essence but to the full let's say exposure to the full blast to the full flow waterfall of his divine energies that flow from his essence and are constantly uh, have permeating his uh, uh, human nature of which we partake okay so in rough terms, uh, again, this, uh, this uh, I would say, it's, uh, um, in, in, I would explain it like that. Now let's go back to the question about the name of God and the energy, right? Which is an important question uh, because names of God, yes, they are energy and they're not energy at the same time. And I will explain how that is. So uh, the, 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 in what sense is name of God energy and in what sense it is not an energy, right? And name of God is a specific matter because it's something that is verbalized. It's something that is, it can be 
thought can be articulated, can be written. Therefore, it has a created side to it, right? But at the same time, the source of it is God's revelation, right? So therefore, it has an uncreated side to it. So therefore, it has both. It has a created side and uncreated side, right? And that is why I said that, yes, they're both it is the name of name of God is energy of God and it is not energy of God at the same time. So let's sort of unravel that what I just said so that we understand what the names of God uh, mean. Um, if we remember in the uh, when I explained about the energies of God, I said that the truth uh, of God is one of his energies. And we also said that the knowledge revelation of God is his light. Right. I mean, that that. Uh, light that we refer to the light of God is knowledge about him is his revelation it is truth his wisdom right and that is energy of God right well the meanings of the names of God right everything that we know about God is a revelation of God to us the fact that we know that there is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, the fact that, the fact that we know that He's compassionate and merciful and long-suffering, the fact that we know all other things about God, those are revelations of God to us. Therefore, in that sense, it is energy flowing from God, revealing to us truths about Him, right? So everything that we know about God is his revelation. We do not think up things about God. The fathers didn't th sit down and th create names about God. No, it's, it's uh, God that reveals truths about him in throughout the Holy Scripture to his prophets, to his saints, to his apostles. Throughout the Holy Scripture, God reveals himself and tells us truths about him. That activity of revelation, of saying God revealing truths about him god defining himself to us of who he is is divine energy it's a divine activity too okay so that's the truth about god is eternal it's uncreated it's divine uh, revelation therefore therefore it is divine energy but at the same time this truth is at the same time is being articulated in human words right because when we say the truths of God, well, God revealed truth, but he also took a human word uh, that we use in vocabulary, we use in human languages, and clothed that truth in human word so that it would be comprehensible to us, right? So God used human language to express truths about him so that they become comprehensible to us, right? So that is the other side of uh, God's names, right? So the one side we said, the uncreated side is uh, truth about God, right? This truths about God of who he is are eternal. Even if the humans didn't exist, those truths exist. They are eternal revelation, knowledge and truth about God, right? That he reveals to us. But so that we comprehend those truths, right? God used human language to communicate with us, right? So that we have the most basic understanding about God. He took human words like compassion, like mercy, like um, all the other, love, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He took human words and filled them with divine content, with divine meaning. And that in together are divine names so and as we you can see they have two parts the truth of god which is eternal and human words which are uh, temporal they are created in different languages they sound differently right so there is there are, there's a created side to the name of god which are words human words human language and there is uncreated side to the to the name of god which is his truth about himself that is his uh, his revelation about himself and together they make name of god which is both energy of god because the truth the eternal truth about god is an energy is an activity of god his revelation and created side is are the words which god used to explain this 
this, uh, this, these truths in human language. So they're both. At the same time, they are energy of God in terms that the, the, the truth that is hidden in the meaning, right, of the, the, what we say about God is eternal, right? But the words that we use, they are created, right? And in that sense, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not an energy of God, right? So let's take name Jesus, for example, right? Jesus is, in terms of created sight, is a word that is written, it's pronounced, it can be heard, it's pronounced differently in different languages. There were people, other people that were called Jesuses. So as a, a common word, it's not an energy of God. It's part of human language. But God revealed through this word a truth about him that he wanted us to know. What is that truth? What does the name Jesus mean? God saves. Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, means God saves, that God is the Savior. That is the truth that God wanted to reveal through this, uh, this name. Therefore, that truth, right, that God is the Savior, that God saves, is a divine energy. It's, it's part of divine revelation of God revealing, defining, showing us who he is, that he is the Savior. But the word that he used, that is Jesus, right? Those letters and that word in um, Hebrew, Yeshua, and uh, and Greek, Jesus, in English, Jesus, in, in Georgian, Yeso, and, and so forth. That word itself is created, but the truth that it reveals, once God uh, took this word and filled it with divine uh, meaning, right? It's not stops being just a word. It also becomes energy of God, not in its created side, which is created because it's a word, but in its uncreated, hidden side, which is uh, divine energy, right? So uh, St. Maximus even spoke about uh, God's, God's knowledge being incarnate in human words. So he used the same way as we talk about uh, logos, uh, the hypostasis of the logos, that is of the Son of God, uh, being incarnate in human body, mm -hmm. and he being of two natures, right? The uh, invisible one, which is divine, and the visible one, which is his humanity. He he uses that to explain also about uh, knowledge about God, right? That God um, becomes incarnate in all things that we say about him. That the words he assumes words as 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 means of uh, sh revealing knowledge about him so when we uh, when we open the book and see th no uh, things about god we know things i mean we learn things about god of who he is those words are like the flesh that hide behind themselves a knowledge a, a wisdom and revelation and knowledge of God, which is for, goes far beyond those little words that we read, just as the flesh of our Savior hid the divinity, right, uh, uh, behind it. So just as the flesh of our Savior, visible, is only human, but is united to divinity, which is far greater, right? In the same way, the words that God chose uh, to reveal himself in the Holy Scripture, that he is uh, so m m merciful and compassionate, eternal, uncreated, uh, the judge, the, the, the love, and so forth, right? Those words uh, th that are visible uh, are just like a flesh, right? Of the far more, the invisible meaning, truth, which is eternal. Just as uh, a Savior's flesh is created, but, uh, but is united to divinity, which is uncreated, right? So also those words are created, but uh, that but convey the meaning which is uncreated beyond us, right? So in that sense, that is of the eternal truth that flows from those uh, from those words, the names of God, Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, um, God, even uh, right, all those names, uh, the, since they convey divine meaning, are energies of God. But in terms of their created side, that is the words that we use to articulate those meanings, right? They are obviously created. So 
There are two sides to it, just as in our Savior. And I don't want to take this metaphor too far because obviously in our Savior is the person of our Savior who assumes human nature. But here we're talking about energies of God, that is the truth of God, assuming uh, uh, created words, right? But you can draw a parallel, right? Just, just as there, are, there is duality in our Savior that created uh, hides the uh, uncreated, right? So also there is duality in uh, um, names of God where created word hides the uh, uncreated revelation, uh, truth about God, right? So th that is why uh, the, the, um, we can say at the same time that en the name of God is energy of God in the sense that the truth that it reveals and it also is created word. It's not an energy of God because, it, it, because of the, the, the flesh, right, that covers that truth, the, the words that we use to articulate that truth, right? Um, similarity with icons is obvious, right? The icons, they have the visible uh, um, image, right, which is icon, but they hide the divine grace, right, which is present in them. So also words that we use to articulate the name of God hide uh, uh, or in them is present the uh, grace that is the truth and revelation that is sort of articulated through those created words and uh, that is why the um, gospel book for example is called the verbal icon right because it's it's in verbal way just as the paint and the the, 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 that is the painting of the faces uh, reveals, uh, although it's created, there's something behind it that is, that is a connection between the icon and the prototype, that it, the grace is present in the icon. And in the visible icon, we, when we venerate it, we become partakers of divine grace that is present there. So also in the, the Holy uh, Gospel, uh, it, through words, it it, it 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 becomes an icon. That is, that it reveals through simple words truths that are f far greater than those words. Right? In that sense, it becomes a verbal icon. That is, that it has a duality about it. The the visible words and legible words and uh, uh, articulated words uh, have uh, are not simple words. They have truth of God hidden in them and therefore are conveyors of that energy of God and in that sense they are verbal icons right so uh, we can talk about that further if you want uh, down the line about names of God but you can read all that I just said in our definition of the uh, of, of, of our confession of faith about the name of God where all those things that I just said are included uh, it, it, it's, it's called the Divergent Teachings. It's, it's on our website. I can post it here if you want. But uh, all, all those things are, are um, were articulated. Our Metropolitan Ephraim labored greatly that, so that the Orthodox teaching about names of God should be defended against the detractors. On one hand, we have people who say that the names of God are just words. There is no... Uh, sort of grace, there is no greater meaning, there is no um, truth, eternal truth shining through them. They're just words, nothing else, which is obviously is reducing the name of God, name truths about God to mere words. If there's nothing to it, then there is nothing to icons as well. There's nothing to gospel as well. It's just human words, right? There's nothing else to it. That is uh, abominable. That is not the orthodox teaching, right? And on the other hand, you might have people that divinize even the created side of, of the names, which are words, right? And they say that, well, those words become like magical and, and, that, and that is to be rejected too. We do not divinize the, uh, the, the words uh, that is themselves. We, we uh, honor them like we honor icons that they convey grace, but themselves, just like the paint of the icons, the ink and the paper and the words uh, written themselves uh, are not energy of God, they're not God, far from it. And those who accused us of that, and those who were the ones who were saying that, that there is nothing else to uh, names of God but just the words, 
they were telling saying about us that we are divinizing and defying human uh, words right which is nonsense never ever have we done such a thing we always said this, we're strict and clear about saying this duality that there is uncreated side the energies of god present in the name and there is the the outward shell the the flesh that uh, that that is the words that we use to convey that meaning and together they make the name of god and uh, they in that in one sense there is there is a side to it that is uncreated that is the presence of the energy of god his truth his his wisdom his revelation and there is the human created side to it which is language which god used to convey these truths right so uh, i think um, that explains uh, in in short or not so short the uh, um, um, teaching about the names of god in what sense it is uh, energy of god in what sense it is not now also i want to address one uh, final uh, thing here uh, michael um, from seattle said that you know things here are too difficult and maybe we should make it more simple and so forth i want to tell michael right that what i said already and this is not just for him it's for everybody else who might have such thoughts the schools are not there for us to be comfortable in right and this is a school this is not a club we create this specifically to be a school where our knowledge will be challenged and if a school doesn't challenge our knowledge it means it doesn't it is not doing its job properly and there's nothing to be afraid of when we are when our knowledge is challenged or when we find it difficult to uh, learn something or to understand something there's nothing embarrassing there's nothing it's not a problem it's in fact in how it should be when we go to school we go there to learn if we know everything and we understand everything there wouldn't be point of having any schools right and when we go to school there is obviously an apprehension that there'll be things we won't understand what we don't do is to say that the school should stop challenging me stop showing me things that i don't know and should sort of dumb it down to the level where i will understand everything that is not the point of the school uh, that that's that's that would be a circus i mean that would be that wouldn't be the point of what we are doing here and uh, there's nothing scholastic what we are trying to do here and there's nothing wrong with the word scholastic it means just mean learn it right uh, somebody who who tries to learn uh, what we are trying to learn teach and learn here are basics of our orthodox faith it's not for special sort of group of people who are scholars then they should know these things no this should be the common knowledge of the people of god which are the orthodox christians if that were not the case all this that i speak about here would not be part of the divine services of the orthodox church because everything that i say here all these three lessons that i said all those terms that i use all those qualifications and and all the descriptions and uh, uh, and and all those things that i put they're part of the divine services open the octoichos uh, uh, read any uh, you know theotokion right or dogmatic theotokion especially right read any service and you will encounter all these words there all these terms are there so for whom were they written they were written for us for orthodox christians to know them because it is our duty to know them in our age we have fallen so f short of knowledge of our faith that even the mention of these terms sort of creates an uncomfortable feeling that this is supposed to be something for learned and we the simple folk should concentrate on just you know prayer and fasting and some dictums from the fathers that is good and fine but what about the faith we are supposed to know the faith how we will differentiate true faith from heresy if we don't know the basics of our faith and this is a must if it wasn't must it wouldn't be part of the services and if it wasn't a must we wouldn't be told to repeat the creed 
several times a day and to know the creed by heart. The creed is formulations of, of faith, doctrinal formulations of faith. And it is important, so important that the fathers put it there, labored for us so that we would know it. What we're doing here is we're expounding every aspect as much as we can of the creed so that we know what it means. So something that we should know by heart as Orthodox Christians, the creed, would be comprehensible to us. So let us not make this sort of dichotomy of scholars and simple people, right? That is, that is a false dichotomy. That is a false grouping, right? We're all people of God, and we should ha all have basic knowledge of our faith. This is not some deep, deep theology. Yes, there are difficult things to it, but everything is difficult when you start. Two plus two is four is difficult for a toddler. But once he starts to learn the numbers, it becomes part of his life. The alphabet is difficult for a toddler, but once he learns it, he has the key to language, right? So why ask to make things sort of, I don't want to even call it simpler, uh, to sort of to, to bring it low, the bar, when what we should be asking that, you know, how can we raise ourselves up to that bar? That's the spirit we should have. Because there are two ways of approaching new knowledge. Either we flee from it or we try to understand it. And I don't advise anyone, any Orthodox Christian, to flee from this. This is our faith. And simplicity is not ignorance. That is a false uh, narrative that is people love to use it today that, oh, I'm simple, I don't understand things in our faith. Wrong. Simplicity, when we call that simplicity is, a, is blessed, we mean about being guileless, being simple in terms of not knowing how to do evil. In that sense, we talk about simplicity is good. But when we talk about simplicity, even if you can talk about simplicity in terms of that it's ignorance, that's not a virtue. Being ignorant of one's faith is not a virtue. I'm not talking that one should write dissertations. I'm not talking about one should be writing essays and one should be probing and poking, poking every... No, we're talking about dogmas for which the fathers labored. If, we, if that is not important, that why did St. John of Damascus write a whole book about this? For whom? Who is it for? It was for the people of God so that we would know our faith. Why would St. Gregory the Theologian labor to write his explanations of, about Trinity, about the Incarnation and so forth? Is to give the people of God the weapons to differentiate between truth and falsehood about our faith. So to ask that, you know, let's make things sort of bring down the bar uh, so that otherwise people will flee. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not why this school was created. If we want inspirational quotes just to, you know, give us a boost in a day in spiritual life, fine. There are other channels for that. We have the, the Abba, give me a word, which gives that kind of um, knowledge. Uh, and you have fathers of the desert that you can read on your own. We have the sermons that are for that to give us guidance and spiritual boost and explanation of the gospel. And there's a whole channel for that. There are th places where you can listen, but this school was created specifically so that we would feel a bit uncomfortable in our ignorance, just as I feel uncomfortable when I open the book of, of a saint and, and see things that I don't understand and it I want to understand and I try and try and read it maybe again twice three times and and get somewhere right in the same way it's fine for you to feel uncomfortable it's okay but that's what the school is for so let's not have that spirit uh, i ask everyone i'm not singling out anyone here let's not have that spirit let's not have this understanding that 
oh, I'm simple, I won't understand it, and therefore I want something that will sort of be of my measure, right, of my stature, of my level of understanding. That's wrong. It's rather we should have the spirit that, hey, this is the level I should be at. So what is there that, that is impeding me from this? Nobody's dumb. Nobody's stupid. Nobody's full and, 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 and ignorant to that extent that uh, we, we can't understand or at least try to understand these things. It's just that it's difficult. If we are able to, find, to learn alphabet, we're able to understand few terms that are straight you know maybe foreign to us but with with enough questions with enough uh, you know um, sort of effort we'll understand those too if we can learn how to drive a car and pass a test for uh, for 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 the driver's license uh, come on now the, the, we are talking about two paragraphs two paragraphs per lesson three paragraphs max right and that is a, 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 a sort of an obstacle would we go with that spirit to a job? We would go to that spirit to a school? That attitude that, you know, well, I don't understand it, so just bring the bar down for me? No. We would spend day and night trying to understand it. You don't understand a term? Take a dictionary. Open it. See what it says. You don't understand still? Write me and tell me what does it mean exactly. That's why I'm encouraging you to ask questions. It's a school. It's, we're supposed to be challenged. We're supposed to be, have this uncomfortable feeling that I need to know more and therefore I'll try to know more. But to that uh, way of thinking that we have to make things simple, otherwise people will go, well, who is the loser here, right? If we flee from the place where we have an opportunity to digest the teachings of the fathers and to learn them and we turn our back on it who is who is the loser here i wish i had this opportunity when i was uh, you know coming to faith i had to there was no internet there was nothing you had to look for light in libraries and in places and you had writings of the fathers there and there was nobody to explain to you what they were really saying and here you know people are trying to you know take time to write for you in small amount everything that the fathers wrote right about god the father everything that they wrote about the trinity about everything that wrote about essence and energy voluminous amount i'm bringing to you in two three paragraphs digested worked comprehensible encapsulated just work on this you don't have to go there it's here and if you unlock this you'll be able to understand all the other things the services of the church the fathers of the church the the anathemas uh, that we um, say in, in the, on Sunday of all those things it's like a key that I'm giving you so that you can understand all things and you're asking me that I should stop doing this I, I, I'm, I don't know how it, it's, it's, I, I felt discouraged, but I guess, it, and that's why I, I, I felt that it needs to be addressed, that it's not good to, to have this attitude. And I ask that, you know, maybe the fault is with us, that to have such attitude is not the right attitude when we come to be a part of a school. And I'm sure everyone has the capacity to understand it. I'm sure everyone has a capacity to ask questions if you don't understand and to contact me directly if you feel embarrassed to put the questions there. But let's not come to the school with the attitude that things are not, I don't understand things and therefore, therefore things should be changed here. As I say, this is not the only place. If you, other things are provided too. Uh, we have sermons for the whole year, Sunday after Sunday, a whole collection of sermons. We have uh, updates about the church life. We have the uh, uh, the lives of the uh, saints that are printed. The uh, all these things and and the uh, Abba give me a word that gives um, simple quotes from the fathers that are so important for a practical way of life. Right, 
but apart from that, we need a place where first and foremost we'll go through the faith. We'll go to, we'll touch other topics as well. We'll touch things about spirituality. We'll touch things about uh, moral issues, the life in, in the world and today. We will touch all those things. But unless the foundation of faith is solid, what are we going to build on? And this is the opportunity, an opportunity, a real opportunity, that I don't know how I can find so much time, but I try to find time so that you have both the, 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 that lesson and that I read the questions and I take time, hour, two, on a Friday when uh, I should be doing somewhere else, be somewhere else maybe, right? Sleeping maybe. Uh, but I take time to do it, right? Well, is it that difficult to follow and to say, well, let me try? I doubt that it's that difficult. So I ask everyone to please come with right spirit, with right attitude, so that you, you, we'll learn something here. And that's why I will also do little testing. Very simple, but testing nonetheless, so that everyone will have to hand in their answers to me uh, privately. And anyone that does not hand in an, uh, uh, an answer, uh, uh, not that passes the exam, there, is, there won't be failings. I mean, I will address every wrong uh, answer individually and tell them that this is wrong and this is the right answer. And there won't be failing because of a wrong, wrong answer, but there will be expulsion if there is no uh, feedback at all. If I post a, a, a three questions and I fail to receive an answer from anyone in the group, politely they will be asked to leave because if, if the school was created for participation okay and every one of you i'm sure have that capacity let's have willingness as well okay willingness is what is needed and right understanding where we should be simple and where simplicity is not a virtue therefore to know basic things about our faith is a virtue is what we need it and this is an opportunity to receive that knowledge even in a tiny bit let's use it so this is where the few words i wanted to say about that uh, topic for everyone and uh, uh, i hope you take it to heart okay on monday i'll, I'll post the next lesson about the incarnation our savior becoming man and uh, that will be what we will uh, uh, be studying uh, next uh, uh, Monday. Uh, until then, if you still have questions, well, write to me. I'll try to find uh, time, although I'm on a pilgrimage. I'm, every day we are visiting holy places here. Uh, I'll still try to find time to, to, to answer you, okay? All right, then. Well, God bless you. Have a good night. Well, have a good day there. And, uh, and until Monday, then. All right?